How many of you went to the Blue Zone? We think there may still be some who are in the Blue Zone. <laughs> are in the zone. No. Nah. So a, br a brief history for those of you who have not previously experienced Saturday morning in Chapel Hill. The first one was in 1981. It was in Memorial Hall. Uh, as the name might suggest, it was taken from the late Charles Kuralt, and Charles Kuralt actually was a participant in Saturday Morning in Chapel Hill in 1981. Over the years, we've done a variety of things, including having, for a few years, a debate between the student debate team and an alumni team from the 25th reunion class. We did doctor the questions so that the 25th class uh, one virtually every time. Uh, and in recent years, we've been kindly uh, benefited by the emeritus status of Dick Bedour, who has uh, graciously agreed to moderate for several years now a session that blends together the current students and those from reunion classes. And that is a different Dick Bedour than you'll see after the break where he will be wearing the hat of someone in the 25th reunion class. So, oh, I keep Thank going you, back. Thank yeah, you. I, I, yeah, I, I, I can I, see I, your, I can <laughs> see your medallion. Yes, the 50th. All right, Dickie. Thank you, Doug. Thank you all for coming. This is about uh, not so much transition. This is about the way it was and the way it is. So let's think about it this way. Saturday classes, no Saturday classes. Y Court, the pit. Woolen Gym, the Smith Center. La Pizza, the only place to get a pizza, and a hundred places to find a pizza. Weegeons and flip flops. <laughs> Khaki pants and a madras shirt. And what's a madras shirt, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of things that are the same. We're going to explore what is different and what is the same, and we've got a wonderful panel here. This part of the panel, I'm not worried about a bit. <laughs> they got a good night's sleep, and they're ready to go. This part of the panel is really shaky. <laughs> but what we're going to do is have, this is what I'd like for each panel member to say your name, your major, what, you remember that, don't you, Joyce? Okay. Your hometown before you came to Carolina in your hometown now or where you think your hometown is going to be, okay? And what your profession is. Let's start it. Hello everyone, my name is Evan Lumbra. I'm from Rye, New York. Uh, I study business and religious studies. I'm graduating today. I'm moving to Atlanta uh, in the fall. Good morning, my name is Mari Metzler. I'm a political science communication double major graduating today. I'm moving to Atlanta in the spring. Good morning, everyone. I'm Madeline Karst. I'm studying public policy as well as sociology. I have one more year. Thank you, Jesus. Um, I am from Clayton, North Carolina, in Johnson County, and, and I don't know where I'll end up after another year here. Uh, I'm Drew Roberts. I'm studying physics and political science. Um, I'm from Hickory. Yeah, yes, sir. Uh, strange combination, but I'm trying to make it work. Um, I'm from Hickory, North Carolina, and while I apply to law schools, I'll just call Chapel Hill home. Can I interrupt a second? You all are very loud and articulate, but I really think if we could use the mics, it will help, especially since we expect more people to come in. So they're right behind us here. Let's get them out. I'm Bob Hunter um, from Marion, North Carolina, and uh, political science, and then on to, to law school. Uh, still live in Marion, and 34 years in between commuting to Raleigh um, each week, but retired now. Hi, my name is Jackie Cook. I graduated from the School of Pharmacy. I practiced pharmacy for 44 years in five different states, um, and I'm now living with my husband in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, home of the shag and beach music. Uh, I'm Frank Martin. I was an economics major. Uh, I lived in Chapel Hill. I grew up in Chapel Hill and lived in Chapel Hill when I was here in school, and for the last almost 40 years, I lived in Charlotte. 
I'm Joyce Watt Herman. I, I was an English major from Reedsville, North Carolina. Uh, I had a baby store, and that was my career, children's store. And um, now I live outside of Austin, Texas with John Harmon. <laughs> okay, thank you all. So the first question deals with um, how you got here and how you communicated to whom. So uh, Bob and Jackie, why don't you start off about what was your move in like uh, to Chapel Hill and when you did go home, how did you go home? Um, no. <laughs> Showing on. Let me try. Let me try this one. Um, first of all, Dickie, there's something wrong with what's up here. Um, this was 62 through 66 class, and one of these two ladies would not be here. You had to, you had to be a junior, be a junior. to get in as a lady, uh, or there was a couple freshmen, one nursing and phys all the, pharmacy, all the medical, physical therapy. All the medical, yeah. So. Um, and also, if it were back then, uh, you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here. Uh, there would be one woman, and uh, there were almost no African Americans back then. So that was kind of the context of what we grew up in. And, you know, um, thank God we've, uh, we've changed. So it's glad to see all these, this diversity. Uh, and we're glad to win. When I was here, you know, we wanted more women. Because uh, we didn't have anybody to date. These <laughs> ladies wouldn't date uh, us. But uh, no, it, we dated off campus a lot. But that's, that's the other difference. I'm getting to, to that in a minute, Bob. To, to I want to know how you got here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I came uh, from Mary in a little small town and uh, moved in. Uh, your parents bring you down, and uh, nobody had a car. I, and uh, so, as far as going home, uh, I was in Erring House first year it opened. Uh, as far as going home, most of the time I thumbed home. And uh, back and forth. And back then, that was the way, unless you had somebody, maybe an upperclassman, that might be going to the same town that you were. Uh, but but didn't, go, uh, didn't go home too much. Uh, had a girlfriend there, so I probably went more than uh, some people, and probably more than I should have. I'd been better off staying down here. Jackie. Hi, yes, I lived in Charlotte. There were no cars on campus for any freshmen, no cell phones, <clears throat> no ACs. No air, no air conditioning, lived in Spencer dorm, talked to my mom once every two or three weeks for two minutes because that's all you were allowed at the phone at the bottom at the end of the hall. Okay, well now we're going to ask uh, two students. We'll ask uh, Evan and Madeline, how'd you get here and, uh, and when you do go home, how'd you, how do you go home? So I, I usually fly home. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty easy. Go off just the RDU. You just take forty. Um, <laughs> so what's moving in here like now? Moving it. So it's been it's been a while. Uh, not as long as y'all, but it still it seems far away. Um, so I lived in Craig my freshman year. Uh, thankfully, there was an elevator. Um, I was on the first floor though, but just chaos of cars lined up and helping take in mini fridges with mom and dad and uh, stuff like that. Yeah, I was thinking more about the, the structure of it. Assigned times, is that right, to, to come? And who, who can talk about that a little bit? Okay, so I'd love to talk about that. Um, so I still live on campus. I have for the last three years. Um, moving is hectic. Um, everyone, their mom, their dogs come. It's their sisters, their brothers, their aunts. Um, and you're on an assigned time. And pretty much your freshman year, you're like, on an hour. So you get there at 11 and they are in and out. They're like, see you later, mom. You got to get out of here. Um, it's crazy. I lived in Craig uh, my freshman year as well. Um, and cars, I don't know if you have been on South Campus, but Craig is very small and condensed. There's like a very small parking lot. So 400 students, probably 100 of them coming in at 11 is hectic. Um, but it was so much fun at the same time. Everyone's sweating, and um, the AC isn't turned on in our rooms, but we had it, which was wonderful. Um, yeah, so moving is crazy, but it was on a time schedule, and the RAs, the residential advisors, were hard to that time, and they were like shooing my parents out, which was tragic for an 18-year-old. <laughs> Jackie mentioned this a bit, uh, but Joyce and Frank, how often did you talk? with home with your parents and how did how did that actually happen and how long would you typically do it it was really 
There was a pay phone in the hall, and so on Sunday afternoon, I would put in my 25 cents, call my mother, collect. She would refuse to accept the call, but that was a signal that she would call me back so that she could pay for it. <laughs> and that's what we did every Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Frank, give it a try. Uh, well, I, I lived in Chapel Hill, so oh, uh, you I, I, I lived at home my first year in the fraternity, my second year at home again my junior year, and in the fraternity my last year. Okay, so Drew and Maya, why don't you give us a shot at that? Um, sure, so I talk to my parents in some form <clears throat> most every day, whether it's just a text or they call me. Um, so I had pretty, pretty close contact with uh, my parents. It's easy to communicate. I'm the same. I talk to my mom on the phone at least every other day. We text most likely every single day, and I talk to my grandma like every other day as well. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about football weekends. Joyce and Frank, what, what was that like? Or any of the old guys down there, what, what was that like going to a football game? Well, it was a major social event, and when, when we were here, I don't remember it was a major athletic event. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had Ken Willard, y'all remember, we had one All-American football player, but I don't think we had much in the way of winning teams. Uh, you'd, uh, it was coat and tie. Yeah, you put on a sports coat and, and a tie. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, and uh, it's often you'd have to, sometimes you'd leave it early in 8, 9, 30, 9 in the morning to go pick up your date over in Raleigh because there were, weren't many, at least our first two years. Uh, I, 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 I and many of my friends would take a flask inside, sneak it into the football game, and the football game was for all the world a sort of an extended cocktail party. And the girls would wear, a, I had a little corduroy suit that was a little skirt and a little matching jacket and heels we wore heels and we just we always had a date and we'd walk down it was the games were always on Saturday we didn't have any Thursday morning games or <laughs> just, so it was Saturday morning that's what you did and we'd all walk down in a big group and it was it was lots of fun so who wants to tackle that what's it like you got the microphone go for it Mike. all right well I've had the opportunity to um, experience football weekends from three different perspectives my freshman year I worked for Tar Heel Athletic Hospitality which works up in the blue zone so with old alumni and um, other people just coming to watch the game I've got to experience it from a member of Order the Bell Tower we work the Chancellor's Box and then as a student which is obviously the most fun and um, I would say my most fun experience with football was homecoming this year which was amazing we played duke we blew them out um we were in the tar pit and it was the most crazy experience I've, it was uh, just exhilarating but um being a foot um being a student here especially when, now that we're good it was a lot more fun so um than the past couple of years but um yeah football weekends are amazing okay Evan, you want to try that sure so as far as uh, what we wear, uh, not that some people do suit and tie dress, but I never did that. It was um, probably a Carolina T-shirt or maybe like Carolina blue button up, something like that. Um, it wasn't wasn't too formal of an event. No dates uh, for the most part. Uh, just generally, everyone will be at the games. So if there's someone that you're trying to see, just find them in the crowd. Um, and straight, all the students. I assume there was a student section at the time, but. All the students sing together. It just gets uh, really excited compared to the rest of the stadium. So it's uh, a really fun environment, I would say, for, for everyone involved. Do you know what a card section is? <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe Bob can tell, tell you what a card section is. Well, yeah, that was kind of a, a big, big deal. Um, everybody had a card and in this particular section, usually right there along the towards the 50-yard line, and, and it was more than just students, from what I remember. Uh, and they passed them out, uh, and at halftime, they had a, a display, a show, and it would be, uh, you know, obviously if it was Duke, it would be uh, a lot different and a lot more excitement, but uh, the big thing was, it was uh, from the other side, uh, really you could see it, and it added a lot of, uh, to a football game, but the big thing was they were always worried about throwing cards and uh, by the way if anybody was in Houston it was throwing seats that they gave us uh, Dick Hughes all that um, so I guess some things never change but uh, yeah it was uh, it was a fun thing that 
those throwing cards was not unrelated to what Frank was talking about, what was in the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> so, Bob, why don't you talk a little bit about going to basketball games and then pass it to Jackie. How'd you get tickets and so forth? Um, you know, I'm spending the weekend with Bill Hunt, one of my buddies, and so I was asking these same questions to Bill last night, and we were talking, and it's helping refresh our memories, but we didn't have any problem getting uh, basketball tickets that uh, we remembered. We were able to go to, uh, to every game, and I guess, uh, you know, the, the Duke tickets were harder, and if you were in a fraternity, a lot of times uh, uh, the brothers would send the pledges down to to uh, get the tickets and stand in line for them, things like that. But I never had trouble getting uh, tickets to a basketball game. Did, did any of y'all? Yeah. Jackie? I was a freshman cheerleader, so I got, I got, <laughs> <laughs> I got automatic entry. But there, there were some lines later on. And uh, that was Dean Smith's first three teams, obviously. So it was before we started having uh, a lot of success on the court. But we still enjoyed our teams, and to keep us, try to keep us out of there, it would have been a real fight. So we, we were supportive, and we were glad they were there. Yeah. Will and Jim, and then Carmichael. So Drew, can you explain what it's like now? We got all the mics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not as easy to get tickets to basketball games anymore. Uh, the, definitely the alumni and just fans from Chapel Hill take up a lot of the room. Um, but the, basically the way we come get in is I have a student ID card. We just swipe it at the door, walk right in. Um, for ACC games, we have to enter an online lottery beforehand to see if we actually have tickets to go to the game. And for the Duke game, we're only guaranteed to go once in our four years. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, it's not quite as simple as, as far as just getting into the, the really popular games. Um, but we have pretty, we have one student section that's right underneath one of the goals. And uh, we have a little bit of a corner pocket and then basically we'll, the rest of us will be in the, the upper tier of the Dean Dome. Mally, do you have anything to add to that? Basketball games are still awesome and it's hard to keep us out. Um, I think that hasn't changed at all in the last 50 years. Yeah, so there's a riser section, um, and it's like three little like risers between the goal and the end of the court, and that is crazy to get a riser uh, wristband is, wow. Um, you have to be really on point um, and get the Dean Dome early to get that. Um, but if you are there, you're on TV, so everyone loves that. Um, they dress up, they dress crazy, they dress in costumes, they print signs um, for the other team to see. Um, some of them are funny, some of them are not so kind, but um, I guess what's all the same is that like our passion is, is awesome, and man, Carolina basketball, it doesn't get much better than that. Cool. All right, let's compare some registration uh, process. Joyce, do you want to you wanna handle that one? How did you register? Well, there was a lot of discussion about that. And how did that you drop a, an ad course? Well, I know how to do that. All right. Well, I, think, <laughs> I think the way we decided, the way we registered was that we went to Woolen Gym, and we had cards with our schedule on it. And if that didn't work for us, like if we had an 8 o'clock Saturday class and we didn't want to take it, we'd go to drop ad, and that was just card, just a file with the cards in it for the classes, and you would just pick the class that suited you. And if you couldn't get in that class, you, as a final resort, you'd go to see the professor and try to beg and cry to get in. But that's, that's what I remember. I don't really remember registering, but I'm sure I did. <laughs> <laughs> if you got out, you did. Frank, can you add to that? Well, I, I was thinking, we were talking about this yesterday morning with a friend, I said, you had really high priority issues like, could you avoid any classes before a certain hour? <laughs> and if you wanted to pack it up, they, we were Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. You'd arrange to have no Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. It didn't matter what, what, what academic <laughs> discipline it was, did it fit your schedule? Jackie or Bob, anything to add on that? I, I tell you what, how did, how did you actually pick the courses that, that you wanted? Well, in pharmacy school, they oh, yeah. dictated what yeah. we took, so we really didn't have any choice on that. Uh, we had nine courses of chemistry, which were nine miserable courses for me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had physics. We had no typewriter. All, all papers were written by hand. So um, for me, 
there, there was no choice and no lines. You just knew that you had to be at certain classes at a certain time. So that was, a, that was an easy choice. Well, we didn't have uh, apps that had class. I'm anxious to hear from them. I've got a daughter that graduated in 2007, undergraduate, and so I've heard a little bit. But uh, we would, uh, it was word of mouth. Everything was word of mouth as the courses. You knew what you had to take those early years, and you didn't have much freedom. But uh, as far as professors, you tried to get the ones that you thought were interesting, and obviously they give you a good grade. So uh, things, uh, Things haven't changed, and quite frankly, if you could get in one that had some athletes in it, you thought you might have a, a better chance, because back there, back then, Mike, <laughs> I was in one with Billy Cunningham, and he was the curve, according to what people thought, and uh, I ended up with a pretty, pretty good grade. But, uh, you know, in the fraternities, you knew, they told you, the upperclassmen, they told us what classes were the good professors and which ones you could expect to get a better grade. And, if they had a syllabus and you knew that they used the same notes, that made it even more interesting. So <laughs> things change, but they don't always change. Let's find out. <laughs> Go ahead. I want all of y'all to talk about this. Um, so everything with registration is online now. Um, I think there's kind of a common experience. Uh, basically, you have a shopping cart. You uh, can go on a website and add, you can look up the syllabi for a lot of different classes or a short description of the class. Um, and it says what requirements it fills. We have to hit so many general education requirements. Um, so people are kind of going and picking and choosing what they need to make sure that they uh, get their social science requirement and their natural science requirement and all these different ones. Um, so you add a lot of classes to your shopping cart and then you'll have an assigned time. It'll be like Wednesday at 8.15 a.m. Um, and so then you have to get on and, and you click um, enroll and you just hope, hope, hope that it puts you in any, in any of those classes. Um, for a lot of the younger students, the first years and such, they're not gonna get like, any of the classes that they want. They're gonna see like, five red etses in the classes they try and enroll in. Um, so it's, it's stress, st very stressful for undergraduates, uh, especially the younger ones. But as you get into the senior year or something, it's, it's a lot, lot more calm. Um, in freshman year orientation, um, where you go before classes um, officially start, they're like, the first thing they said was, kids, don't cry about registration. And I was like, why would I cry about registration? That's weird. Um, get to registration, I get it. Like, I was sitting in the computer lab, and I was like, <laughs> like, where's my mom? I need help. Um, <laughs> um, but when you do get red X's or um, when you don't get into a class that you want, there's something that you can download to your phone where it'll text you when the class opens. So if so many kids drop the class, you'll get a text message, and it'll say, like, um, public policy 220, uh, there's an opening the whole world stops when you get that text message. Like you, you run home to your dorm or you run to Starbucks if, you're, if you have your computer in your book bag um, and you get to that registration page as fast as you can um, because probably 100 other students got that text at the same time you did. And there's probably only one spot open. Um, it's a mad rush. Like the sheer terror on people's faces when they get those text messages is, um, well, one, funny. Um, and two, like it's just... It's stressful, I guess, um, until you get the class that you want, but we do beg um, professors still um, to get into the class as well. Okay, wait, before you answer, let me just give you a comparison. So if you went past the two-day drop ad period where you went to one space and you wanted add, you went to the department and they gave you a card if that class was open. So nobody alerted you, you had to go get that card and then take it over to, to Haynes Hall, but you also had to get the old card that you were dropping, so you had to go to that department as well. Go ahead, Maya. Okay, so academic advisors are really helpful here on campus. So, you know, as she said, like the summer before you, um, classes start, they're helping you out. They're like one-on-one -on -one attention with you. But then after that, like it's on your own to go to academic advisors and make sure you're on course or getting your major and minors, whatever's going on. Um, also just as helpful with classes, we have something, if you Google it, it's called Rate My Professors. So we have apps, there's websites, and um, UNC students, it's, it's for all schools around the nation. But you just go on there and you talk about um, how helpful was the teacher, if they were interesting, 
um, and then the grade you got. So I, I go in there like every semester and check to see what other students are saying about the teachers literally before I enroll in the class. And if the um, teacher has like a bad score, I will not enroll in that class unless I have to. Unless like the, that's the only professor for the class. So um, yeah, that's really helpful these days. Not much to add to that, except uh, I guess the ad drop period now, um, well, it's changed since we've been in Carolina. Uh, so I think for the last, for those who are seniors now and juniors, we have had an ad drop period of about it's like eight weeks. So you can add a class in eight weeks into the, or drop a class, excuse me, eight weeks into the semester, um, which has been really nice. I think it's since changed. I think it's now eight days. Um, uh, but, and that's the, also the drop period. Okay. Let's stay on this line, and I would like for everybody to talk about a favorite professor that they had and why, and how did you, how do you interact with professors, with the faculty? So we'll start down there. Bob, we'll go in reverse and, and save Joyce. So go ahead, then we'll go that and come back around. Well, um, when I walked in this building, it was a pleasure to see the way it is now. It's amazing because uh, my p favorite professor uh, was a was a Latin professor by the name of Bill de Grumman. And so I had, I think, three Latin courses in this building. And uh, he was, I guess, the one professor that I kind of connected with, and, and he kind of took an interest in me. So um, I, um, I sought out his courses, and, and he was my, my favorite uh, professor. I had a lot of other professors I liked, but the relationship I had with him was special. My, my favorite professor was, was Dr. Boyd in this very room. He ta taught religion. He was entertaining and informative and always willing to talk to you uh, on one-on-one -on -one basis if you had a problem. Um, I also went back to all of my professors uh, in general college and in pharmacy and introduced myself and talked to them because I wanted to be more than just a face or a number in a class of 200 or 300. So I found that very, very um, helpful in case anybody needed to, uh, to pass this on. Go to them, talk to them. They're very willing and uh, to, to try to be as helpful as they possibly can. So that was great. Uh, my recollection wasn't that I had relationships with many. I, Dr. Boyd, I do remember he, he was spectacularly uh, well-liked and wonderful professor. I had a man named David Brown in economics. And I was in uh, freshman, sophomore honors, which were real small, uh, smaller classes. So I got to know Dr. Brown then, and then I took the, my third and fourth year with some economics. And then he ended up later writing a recommendation for me for graduate school. And I would say that he was the one that I had, but uh, among the very few, maybe the only, that I would have said I had a relationship with then. Well, I'm echoing everybody, but Dr. Boyd was just incredible. I mean, his class was so packed, people were standing in the back, and he'd be in the middle of a sentence, and this is a religion class, and you know, here are all these college kids taking religion, but the way he presented it, and he'd be in mid-sentence, the bell would ring, and he'd stop talking, and we would just be hanging. We just didn't want it to be over. So, like Frank, I didn't have a really one-on-one -on -one relationship with the other professors, but they were, it was a great experience. And Dr. Boyd, I hope you're still teaching. I think he is. <laughs> So what's it like now? Go ahead. So uh, my professor is also a religious studies professor, my favorite. Um, his name is Brendan Thornton. He's a younger professor. He, his first year at Carolina was my first year at Carolina. Um, and he was my first religious studies class here. So I took African American religions with him. And then I took him again this year um, with a capstone class for the major. Um, he, he's written recommendations for me. We, we definitely have just chat in the hallway. I think the, the professor I've probably had the closest relationship with was also in religious studies named Brandon Bain. Um, I actually got a beer with him yesterday. Um, th th he advised my, my thesis this year. So, so you're sort of meeting with him over the course of semester. We've, we've developed a relationship, talk a lot about football and the ACC and the Big 12. <laughs> Okay, my favorite professor is Michael Waltman. He's in the communications department. I've taken three classes with him so far, or through my undergrad career. Um, and it's social cognition, persuasion, and hate speech. So I took hate speech this semester with him. And I just think he was so brave to teach that class. And I can tell he's so passionate about, he has wrote books on it, so he's very passionate about the topic, especially he's trying to um, do inclusion and diversity on campus. So I just love him for doing that. And it doesn't help to get an A in the class as well. <laughs> 
Um, so my mom always says, like, within the first, I talk about my mom a lot. She's awesome. Um, within the first three, like, within the first two weeks, like, make sure you go see your professor. Um, she always told me that in high school. She's like, Maddie, when you go to college, make sure you do that. Um, and so ever since freshman year, I've really just tried to befriend my professors. I mean, there's obviously, like, a boundary. They are my superior, and they're, they're leading me in my education. But um, I, I do want to become more than an, um, just a number as well. Um, my favorite professor is Benjamin Meyer in the public policy department. He is, well, crazy. Um, he teaches ethics and public policy, which is really just about um, like what makes policies ethical or not. Um, and so through that, he um, has PowerPoints for his lectures. And on his PowerPoints, he'll have like random videos of musicals. And he'll sing to us in class. And um, he, he'll come up dressed up sometimes. And um, he really just makes the experience really fun. Um, he tells us to interact with him on Twitter um, after class if we found something interesting to tweet about it, uh, which Twitter is just a really quick way to like communicate over the internet. Um, he knew my name the first day of class. Um, he knew my nickname the first day of class, which like freaked me out, but it was kind of cool at the same time. And um, even now, we, we're friends on Facebook. Um, this is after I finished his course, but um, he's just someone who like really cares about his students and wants to know who we are, like why we're interested in public policy and what justice means for America. Um, and that's just really inspiring and empowering, and that's why I really enjoyed his class. Um, for my favorite professor, I'll, I'll say Sean Washburn. He's a physics professor professor here. Um, he's probably not a popular answer for that. He's very, very dry um, and kind of scary, to be honest. The first, uh, the first class I had with him, it's what I consider my first real physics class. And he walks in. He's carrying a book. He puts it down on the desk. He says, this is the book. Slams it down, turns around, and starts talking into the board while he writes equations. No one could hear him. Um, so it, it seems like a not great experience, but I think uh, he just, once you break him down, if you go to his office, you, you find out that he really does care. And um, if you're not understanding something, he'll let you ask him question after question after question until you finally break through and, and understand it. So I think, I think that's one thing at Carolina, is it just seems like all the professors are, are so caring and really um, are gonna do whatever it takes. It doesn't matter how long they have to stay past their office hours um, for you to understand it. So that's, that's it. Great, thank you. I just want two of you to answer this because I know they'll be re the answers will be repeating. So Joyce and Frank, what did you wear to class? <laughs> <laughs> Gee. Uh, we actually dressed. We didn't, we didn't have jeans. We didn't have flip-flops. We wore little skirts and matching sweaters. And we got up and we curled our hair. We put on makeup. <laughs> I don't think they do that anymore. But that, that was, we didn't have backpacks, so we had to carry those big old books. <laughs> That's what it was. It took, you had to get up early so you could get all that done before you let, went out the door. That doesn't sound much like my remembrance of that, <laughs> curling the hair and the makeups and getting up early. Uh, I would have said something about like I've got on now. Uh, you know, we didn't dress ultra casually. We, did, we had collars on our shirts, for example, but we, nor did we wear sports coats and ties. Do you ever wear jeans to class? I frankly can't remember. I don't, probably not. Probably not. Everybody wore Weegeons. Weegeons. No socks. What do you wear to class? Pretty much whatever I want. Um, <laughs> I've definitely worn flip-flops and a t-shirt and basketball shorts before, and most of the time it's something like jeans or maybe a collared shirt, but uh, the classes here are pretty casual now, and uh, there's really no standard. <laughs> I've seen some sloppy, some sloppy people in class. <laughs> Uh, so you can dress up. I could wear this to class. People would be like, why are you so dressed up today, Maddie? Um, the, there's no dress code, um, not even like a social dress code. It's really, really whatever you want. Um, girls do wear makeup or they'll go to the gym right before class and then show up sweaty with no makeup on. Um, it depends on if you pulled an all-nighter the night before. Um, you'll probably show up in maybe matching gym shorts and a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've seen people who hardly wear anything to class because there's no dress code, so they can just wear their boxers to class, and that's not appropriate to me, but it, it definitely happens. There's people wear jeans, that's, that's like probably dressed up now, is to wear jeans. 
J Jackie, we're going to go to another question. But do you remember what Ms. Carmichael's code was about ladies going to class? You had I'm, not, to I'm not sure. We, we couldn't wear uh, pants. Right. We had to, had wear to wear skirts dress. or dresses. Right. Exactly. Uh, but I wore a lab coat most exactly. of the time. <laughs> I, I'd go by the fraternity party. They'd be having one of these parties, and here I'm drudging along in that white lab coat. <laughs> well, keep the mic and tell me where your favorite place was to eat. The porthole, if it was off campus, uh, Lenore Hall, otherwise, and first two years of Spencer Dorm, we had we ate there in in Spencer Dorm, so that was it. And occasionally somebody had a car and would take us out to uh, to the, the the one pizza place, but that was about it. Bob Pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Bob tried. Uh, I liked the porthole too. Uh, Lenore Hall was. Uh, quickly kind of abandoned by me for the pine room. It was downstairs. I don't know if that's still there or not. But, uh, you know, the interesting thing is after, you know, at night when we wanted to get something to eat at 10 o'clock, after that there was no place in Chapel Hill to get something to eat. We had to go 15501 to that little old, it was like a toddle house it or something over there on the left to get anything <laughs> and it was to eat. So we didn't have many choices. <laughs> Later on in law school, it was Clarence's Bar and Grill. Love Clarence and Sally. Maya, t tell us your favorite place to eat. Um, depends on what I want to eat that day. Um, if it's Mexican, I love to go to Bandito's or Moe's. Um, pizza, there's a new place. It's called Benny's Pizza on Franklin. They have like huge slices for $4. Um, we have a cookie place called Insomnia Cookie that just delivers cookies like all the time. So I go there, get cookies, um, Yopo, go get some frozen yogurt. It's just so many options now and everything delivers, so. Go ahead. Um, I'd say Elmo's Diner uh, down in Carboro is excellent. I recommend it if you have not been. Um, as far as on campus, I haven't eaten at Lenore Hall in quite a while. Um, I don't miss it that much, to be honest. Um, but maybe this is what you were talking about. Below the cafeteria at Lenore, there's um, like Subway and Chick-fil-A and... Um, it's not called Pine Room. No, it's called Bottom of Lenore. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll eat there occasionally. All right, w one last question for the panel, and then we're gonna open it up for questions. And I think this will be major differences. What'd you do in the summers? Joyce, what'd you do in the summer? Everybody answer this one. Okay, I'm gonna be real honest with you. I figured out early that the people that went to summer school were the ones who had had so much fun during the year that they had to go to summer school. So I taught my mother in let, to letting me go to summer school. I went to USC. I came up here twice. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but I had a really good time and I'd take two classes and then if one seemed to be a bit of a challenge, I'd drop it. So I only had the one. <laughs> Sad but true, it's what I did. Uh, the first year, there was a, there was a company, I, I wonder if it's still on campus, called Southwestern, yeah. So I sold Bibles, dictionaries, and family uh, uh, medical books. Door to door, uh, you got a sign somewhere in the country, I was out in Illinois. Uh, I did that one summer and I worked so hard. I mean, you made right much money and the next year you could take people with you if you'd done well. And I came back saying, God, this is great. I'm going to take four, you know, six people with me next year. I'll make so much. And after about a month, I said, why in the world am I going to work that hard? <laughs> and then, so the next summer, I went out west and traveled just uh, with some guys. And the next summer after that, I went to Europe. So oh, I, okay. I went one hard summer and two very easy. Uh, I have a scholarship from Eckerd, so I was working for Eckerd's Drugstore every summer. The first summer was just scooping ice cream and working in the... Uh, the grill there and then the next year I got promoted to the pharmacy department at the cash register and then the next year I started actually uh, helping them count the pills and other other duties in the pharmacy so those we were required to have uh, so many hours experience in the summer so they, my summers were pretty much pre-dedicated. Uh, I was like Frank a little bit I was in the earring house my first year in a guy in our suite had been in a year before and so he taught me into going to Minneapolis, Minnesota to sell that dictionary. And I was in a little community called Golden Valley, and after two weeks, those people had more books. Those were the most educated people <laughs> I'd ever seen in the world. They did not want to buy my books. So after two weeks, I took a bus back home, went to Goldsboro, worked for my brother, whose father-in-law had a construction company, so I painted and was a carpenter's helper for that, uh, that summer. 
uh, worked in a furniture factory till the rip saw and worked in the ruffian one summer and then I got a good job I guess if it was a job I was a state government intern uh, I guess that was my senior year I think and I was assigned to the old um, uh, board of higher education which is now the consolidated university and uh, I was in a group with uh, Susan Earinghouse, D.G. Martin, and a bunch of us. Uh, we, we had a good, good summer. We stayed over state. So I've spent uh, two summers doing internships. One was up around uh, New York City. And then this past summer, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, working with the House of Representatives. Um, and then uh, another year, I took one, one summer of summer classes, and I did uh, physics research in a lab on campus while I was here. Yeah, so mine is like much different. Um, my first year, I was a lifeguard, um, and then after that, I have done. An, I did an internship last summer, and I will be doing an internship this summer in DC. Um, I would say there's lots of pressure on students now to make sure that their summers are geared towards their career goals, or to make sure you're in internships. Um, I don't know if that was the pressure back then, but it's definitely. <laughs> it's definitely like when people ask, "Are you doing this summer?" They really mean, "Did you get an internship or not?" Um, that could be a good thing, could be a bad thing. It was definitely a change, I think. Okay. I've done something. I know. See, we didn't have hardly any of that. So I've done something different every summer. The first summer, um, I went back home and I worked at Cracker Barrel. Um, the second summer, I did summer school. And then last summer, I did a PR internship in the Philippines working for NGO for two months. Yeah, sort of going off your study abroad point, um, I've actually had the cool opportunity with the business school as a part of a class to go on uh, two international study abroad trips as a, um, for, I think each of them were about three weeks or two and a half weeks, uh, one to South Africa and one to India, um, which wasn't even my main event for that su those summers. So my freshman year summer, I worked for uh, did an internship at a nonprofit in New Orleans, and then my second summer, I worked for a startup accelerator in Copenhagen, De Denmark, and uh, last summer I worked for a consulting firm in Atlanta. Very different. So now it's, uh, it's your turn to uh, ask questions or to make comments of, of, our, of our class or of the current uh, students. Any questions? Please. What motivated you to come to Chapel Hill and go to the university here, and did you apply to other universities? <laughs> Yeah, the question was, what motivated you to, uh, to come to UNC? What were your considerations? And did you apply to other schools like Duke? I didn't apply to Duke because I grew up a Tar Heel fan. Um, and I literally told my mom, I, my mom again, I looked at my mom, I was like, Mom, I, I can't do it. She's like, Madeline, they have a good public policy program. And I was like, no, Mom, you don't understand. <laughs> um, my grandparents were Tar Heel fans. Um, They're both tobacco farming kids um, in North Carolina. They didn't have the opportunity to come to college, but Tar Heel born and bred I was. Um, and I applied on a whim, did not think I was smart enough to get in here obviously got in, um, and I applied to State, Wake Forest, and Davidson as well, um, and had gotten into those um, with scholarships, and the moment I saw that I got into Carolina, I was like, I'm doing this, Mom. I was making spaghetti in the kitchen, and I was like, Mom, I'm going, and she was like, oh, okay, and then I started crying because I got in, and it was like me crying on the floor in the kitchen, um, but uh, I decided to come here just because the Carolina spirit, um, I think we can all agree with, is... Um, remarkable, and um, there's nothing else like it, uh, I would say, in the world. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, I was motivated to come to Carolina. My mom went here. She, my family's from Graham, North Carolina, which is about 40 minutes west of here. Um, uh, so I grew up a Tar Heel fan, even being from New York. So I think I was one of maybe two or three of my friends in, New, in, in my high school in New York to apply to Carolina, but happy to be here. I definitely applied to other schools. Unfortunately, I did apply to Duke. I got in, I picked here. Um, so that, that was a great choice. Uh, my junior, the summer after my junior year in high school, I attended this program here called Project Uplift. And it's a summer event for minority students to um, welcome them to UNC, let them know about the campus. So you get to come for free, you get to stay two nights on campus, get to live in a dorm. Um, you get to take like little classes, you get to meet other students, you get to have performances by groups. So that's what really opened up my eyes to UNC because before 
Um, I'm from Durham, and I, Duke was obviously an option before I attended that program. And I was like, wow, I love UNC. Um, I applied to other schools as well, but my choice was between um, here and Howard University, which is an HBCU, and half of my family went there, my mom, my grandma. So I was really pressured to go to Howard. But um, once I got that email saying I was accepted to UNC, I had no other choice but to come here. Um, I'll trust you all not to take this out of this room, but I did apply to Duke and I cheered for them in high school. Um, I went to a boarding school in Durham, so at the time, <clears throat> I'd rather there be celebrations going on in Durham than over here in Chapel Hill. Uh, that's a time in the past and I don't feel that way at all now. <laughs> uh, but uh, I applied to a lot of schools. I applied to Duke, um, some Ivy League schools. It was a competitive high school, so there was uh, a lot of applications going out all over the country, but um, I'd say I picked Carolina. It's just such a good value in, in education, um, pretty unmatched in the country, I'd say. So it was it was an easy choice. Great question. Thank you. Anybody else? Please, Alan. <laughs> Sorry. <It's> <laughs> The question is, uh, are most internships that students get paid or non-paid? Okay, so my internship in the Philippines was unpaid. Um, I had to pay my way out there. I had to pay for where I was staying. Well, my, mom, my amazing mom did all that. Um, so yeah, but it was just, it's, a more, it's more about the experience than the money that, that they say. So um, I think it was more worth the experience than the money for sure. Uh, when I was in D.C. this past summer, I was lucky enough, um, I was in a program that was funded by a Nobel laureate, and so he was very, very generous and, and was able to pay us, but the vast majority of internships that are on the Hill in D.C. Uh, were unpaid, and so people have to, like she's saying, find their own place to live and everything like that, which is expensive in, in a city like D.C., so there is a certain... Uh, barrier there that can make uh, internships difficult, but I think, I think the experience is uh, sort of a prerequisite now for a lot of careers. Just yeah. to quickly add on to that, I think that most, uh, if you have an internship, usually before your junior year summer, they're typically unpaid for in most situations. Um, and if you're, it depends what field you're going into, but for a lot of business internships at least, um, most are paid your, your final summer. You're, start, you're starting to go too far here, Alan. <laughs> but what we did was uh, we get oranges and you inject the vodka into the oranges. <laughs> the problem was that there's so much pressure in an orange that you can't just shoot the vodka and it would start to squirt out. So you had to withdraw a couple of cc's of orange juice first to shoot the vodka in. And then once you got really skilled at it, you could say, do you want your screwdriver to be mild or strong? <laughs> how much orange juice you took out and how much time you put in the tournament of And then you take the oranges to the football game. You know, nobody got scurvy. It was very helpful. <laughs> I did not know anybody who was that smart. The people I hung around with could not handle that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big change. There was a question over here. Uh, Thank you. Out of an Ivy League school to come here from, uh, and it was the best move I ever made. I ended up uh, doing a lot of science work because I was pre-med, pre-dent, and spending all the days in the labs, I looked forward to an easy course. Are there any gut courses here anymore? Dr. Harlan hooked me on archaeology, <laughs> and Dr. Miller hooked me on history. The question is, are there currently any crip courses? I feel like Ed McMahon up here. <laughs> Be careful with your answer. <laughs> Go ahead. 
Okay. Uh, first of all, the orange thing. Wow. <laughs> I don't even... Okay. Um, as far as the easy courses go, there, uh, what she's talking about, rate my, rate my professor. Um, you'll know if the class is easy or not. Um, typically, general education courses are more easier. 100 level courses are going to be easier. Um, I took film analysis, which was a three hour class twice a week, but um, literally we watched a movie for two hours and then talked about it for an hour. Um, which actually is one of my favorite classes at UNC because we actually like analyzed why directors do what they do, like why writers and film like put the dialogue that they do in it. Um, we watched a Disney animated film, I think it's Disney, um, Wally, -E, um, which is like a little kid movie and college students were watching it and we had an hour long discussion that was actually fruitful and in depth. Um, so that class was easy. Um, I definitely got a basically an, an A plus in it, um, but there was still a lot of value to it, which was, which was nice. I wasn't just taking it because it was easy, um, or I was. I didn't realize how much I would actually learn from it. So I'm sure 50 years ago, you all had to take swimming. Well, like it was mandatory, so now it's not mandatory anymore. But we do have something called Lifetime Fitness, LFIT, so every student has to take that class, and um, that's most likely an A-worthy class. Um, you have different options, so I took um, Bike cycling, which I thought was going to be like riding around campus on bikes, but we're actually like in the rooms, like just cycling. Um, there's um, what other do they have? They have skiing. They have um, scuba. Doc, he did golf. Um, there's um, fitness and um, conditioning. There's running, yoga. Um, Scuba dive, there's like so many options. So like whatever you really want to take um, is option for you. And it, it's just take it one semester, um, yeah, three hour course. Okay, we got time for one more question, please. Uh, during our day, we were required to take a foreign language. Uh, is that still the case? And, and what language uh, did the younger generation take? And our generation too, the Question is uh, regarding foreign language. Is it still required and in, in, or if it, it is, what did you take? And if it isn't, did you take a foreign language? Yep, it's, it's still required. I think it's uh, to the, the third level as measured by the university. You have to take a foreign language, so I took Spanish. Yeah, I took Spanish as well. I took French and y'all. Hmm. <laughs> um, it's definitely hard. I took, I started late. I'm gonna be taking French next semester as a senior to graduate. Um, it's difficult, but I did French. Bonjour. Um, yeah, I took French as well. And people kind of start at different spots that might have been the same um, 50 years ago. But if you took it in high school, I took uh, two years of French in high school. So I started at an intermediate level of French and, and took a few more classes past that. Um, but some people start knowing not bonjour, you know. The, the, um, so there's a lot of various levels. And some people go really far in, in the language. Jackie, again. I asked my husband if he knew where Murphy uh, building was, and he said yes. I flunked Spanish three times there, so I know where that building. Oh, just twice. Oh, I'm sorry, not three times. I don't believe I'd have told that, Jackie. <laughs> they tore down Venerable. A lot of people hated that building as well. Let's give our panelists a well-earned round of applause. Thank you. Thank you all. And we have another session coming up. Not for y'all, but good job. Thank you.
questions. So, so, so we have some time for you to address a question to any one of the three or two or, or all three. So I would love for you to have an opportunity. I called him, I said, Dick, how does it feel to be Dean Smith's boss? <laughs> <laughs> and Nicky said, Joe, Dean Smith doesn't have a boss. <laughs> Dean Smith didn't need a boss. Please, Paul. Dick, I have a question for you. You, you all three, what are your boss? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you thought you had the easy job, right? <laughs> Vaughn, thank you. I, I feel um, privileged. Um, I took Coach Smith several times uh, to lunch with Bill Acock, to, to, to see uh, and visit with Bill Acock when, when he was out at uh, Carolina Meadows. I went with uh, Mr. Friday to see Chancellor Acock, I'd say a dozen times. And uh, Chancellor Acock had Linda and I out for dinner out there a handful of times. Um, my favorite stories, I, I'm, not, I'm not prepared for this. Um, here's something you may not know. Bill Friday and Bill Acock were avid sports fans, avid sports fans. Bill Friday would call me on occasion and say, what happened to that linebacker <laughs> that we recruited from Surrey County? I thought he was supposed to be really outstanding. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. You would go see Bill Acott he had a radio right by his bedside. How you doing, Chancellor? Well, first thing he'd say is, don't call me Chancellor, call me Bill. And then he'd say, yesterday's game, I thought our pitching was sort of weak. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that kid from so-and-so supposed to? And it's just, um, just blowing me away. And with Coach Smith, I mean, his lessons um, are so powerful. Um, but I'll tell you this one. I was riding with him somewhere, and I, was, I never talked basketball with Coach Smith, except one time. I just I knew everybody did, and I just wasn't going to talk basketball. But we were riding somewhere, and it was one of those years where three people went pro, and you didn't get this guy in recruiting, and this guy was hurt, and I'm thinking, like, are we even going to have a team next year? And I said, Coach, I'm just really thinking about next year. You've got all these issues. You know, what do you think? Are we going to be okay? We're riding along, and he said, Dick, we're still going to have North Carolina on our jersey. <laughs> so, uh, Dickie, let me uh, – <clears throat> Let me just add one uh, story on, uh, on Coach Smith. Uh, you know, he had so many great uh, qualities of leadership and how he then executed a plan of play hard, play smart, play together. Uh, one of his real driving instincts was discipline. And uh, Mike Cook and I were talking about this uh, yesterday. And if you ask all these old players, what's one thing on discipline that you remember most? And he said, be on time. And um, so, so, so Mike was telling me this story. I think this was the first year. I was probably on the freshman team, so I didn't see it. And I'm not going to use a real name here. I'm going to use my own name, but I wasn't on the team. Um, they were having practice, and um, practices started about 10 or 15 minutes, and uh, Bill Harrison wasn't there. So Bill Harrison walks into the practice, and Coach Smith stops the practice and says, Mr. Harrison, welcome. It's nice that you could come today. I hope you've had a good day. He said, I'll tell you what I want you to do, Mr. Harrison. I want you to pull up a chair that you see right there and sit on the side of the court and watch. 
And he did, I did. And he then turned to the 12, 13 players out there and said, give me 50 full court sprints for Mr. Harrison. Well, guess what? <laughs> Mr. Harrison was never late again after that. Let me tell you a, a quick uh, Bill Friday uh, and athletics story, which I didn't know, everybody else here may know. Um, and some of you may, I know that Ed does, know Jim Babb in uh, Charlotte. Jim told me the other <coughs> night, he said, let me tell you about when Bill Friday called me up because he wanted to go to New York and speak to all of the television executives. This was when there were essentially three major television networks. He said, um, I want to go up there, Jim, and meet with them privately and tell each one of them that they need to stop broadcasting games at midday on Sunday. And Jim said, I got them all. They were quite willing to meet with President Friday from North Carolina. So we met with him, and he told each of them that that was the time of day when families in North Carolina were either just getting out of church or just getting home from church, and there should not be <coughs> any major athletic event occurring at that hour. Now, Jim said it didn't do any good. Uh, there seemed to have been a more powerful force at work uh, than Bill Friday. But it, he went all the way up, went through all of that, uh, because once again, he thought it was important to be able to see the games and for them to be played. But uh, he knew that there were families in North Carolina, presumably all around the country, uh, for whom that was not a good time for a game. So Coach Smith was just uh, so totally against commercialization did not want it anywhere in the Smith Center. This is another story. He came to my office one day and said, I thought we we're not supposed to have any signage in the Smith Center. I said, Coach, we don't. He said, well, you need to come see what I'm seeing. <laughs> we go up there. There's, he said, there's a Coke sign down here. So we go up there. You know what? There was a Coke sign. It was on the vending machine. <laughs> I said, Coach, I can't do it. Cal will tell you one more. <laughs> so he retires, and I said, Coach, where do you want where do you want your office to be? I mean, you know, your name's on the building. You can <laughs> you can have it anywhere you want it to be. He said, I want it to be in the basement. I said, Coach, we don't have any windows down here in the basement. Everything in the basement is, is secluded. No, that's where I want to be. I want to be to the humility. I want to be out of sight. His players got furious. You've put Dean Smith in the basement. <laughs> Please, that's where he wanted to be. Other questions? Y'all spoke about the big impact of the big three in the last 50 years. Would it not be a good idea like, to acquire a freshman course on leadership and history? I mean, I mean a full credit course. To have something like that set up, or maybe in the business school. With all that, take you to the business school. I, mean, I, <laughs> I think we ought to have a course in it uh, for all uh, entering Tar Heels. Uh, it's uh, you know, I know when you get older, like I am, you bemoan more powerfully the notion that young folks don't know our history as uh, strongly as uh, they should. Um, that's part of why we worked on this uh, documentary last year with the idea of showing it in high schools. Um, people don't know the, I mean, I, I know that President Friday uh, and President Aycock have felt like um, that the legacy of their lifetimes, which is an unbelievable commitment of a life's work, to f investing in and furthering the uh, life of the state in which they live. They all were, I mean, everybody knows this, they all were affected by poverty and the like. They were affected when they came back from World War II with the state of North Carolina. All of them talked about the fact that we had more um, folks disqualified from military service in World War II than anyone else. Uh, uh, looking at research of that era, people, 
used to not say, thank God for Mississippi. They said, thank God for North Carolina. Uh, and these folks came back from World War II and decided they were going to commit their lives to building up the state that they loved. Uh, and all the time they had in their heads people from small towns from uh, the wrong side of the tracks and opening opportunity uh, to them. So uh, I think that, that, that affected all of these folks uh, very powerfully. I think it's not widely understood, uh, the course of history in North Carolina, in the same way that it's not, uh, even with young black kids, they don't understand as much about the civil rights era as you would think that they would. So uh, uh, I would be for such a course and uh, making it mandatory myself, but that's why I'm an old geezer. I'm not a young liberal arts professor. Here's one.
1968, uh, flying combat missions in the helicopter squadron. He wrote me the nicest letter and just said, <laughs> So, Bob, I saw you and Jimmy come in a little bit late, and I was thinking the same thing. But, um, but let me tell you, we're all part of the Carolina way, the Carolina family here. And from a basketball perspective, it's just an interesting uh, snippet. Uh, there were eight of us on the freshman team that ended up playing varsity basketball. Um, and Johnny Oakley died, uh, sadly. So there were seven left, and we all showed up for dinner Thursday night for our 60, I mean our 50th anniversary. And, and that right there speaks volumes about not only Coach Smith and what he meant to us, but the university. I mean, it was, it was extraordinary. And we've had a great uh, 50th anniversary, all sharing stories and being here. Well, I don't know about Reconstruction, and I know, in this case, more about President Friday and Chancellor Aycock, but the Depression had a gigantic impact, uh, particularly on President Friday. The, the mills had closed uh, in Dallas. Um, he saw poverty very close to home. They lost their home, um, uh, and he never forgot it. He, Tom, you'll have to correct me, but he, he also makes the sort of hilarious statement in that documentary where uh, he'd been, they'd been living hand to mouth and Roosevelt came in and uh, he got a job through the WPA or something and paid him 56 cents an hour or something. He said, I've been a Democrat ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to need to get all of you uh, to your lunch or to your activities of the day we hear the term Carolina Way a lot, and I can't think of three people more who invented and developed and nurtured the Carolina Way than the three giants in, that we've been talking about and the three gentlemen that we have here. So join me in welcoming them. Thank you very much for that. Oh my gosh. I hope it was. That, that was, was great. Really good. Very good to I see you again. You Take care. Thank you. Thank you, sir, buddy. Oh, baby. He... Oh, that was loud. Okay, now, I just wanted to say, for those of you going to the alumni luncheon, you can just, you have plenty of time to walk down to the alumni center. And if anyone needs the shuttle, it's out there, but it can only take 14 people at a time. So I would encourage those who can to walk. It's not raining, lovely day. Thank you.